Hello, and welcome to our first video uh, in the series for Anatomy and Physiology, uh, an interactive journey for health professionals. Uh, we will begin with uh, Chapter 1, uh, Anatomy, Physiology, and Disease, Learning the Language. Health professionals will speak a, uh, what seems like a very confusing, very convoluted language called medical terminology. Now this first chapter will lay the foundation for learning this new language. This is something, or this is something that you absolutely have to be able to understand or at least be able to somewhat follow to be able to understand anything beyond chapter one in the way that some terms are put together what some basic prefixes mean what some basic uh, suffixes mean if you don't under understand some of those basic rules and basic principles any material beyond this point is going to be very difficult to follow see so uh, future chapters will build upon what we talked about here in chapter one so when we get done, not only will you understand anatomy, physiology, and disease, but also be fluent in the language. Uh, the learning objectives for this chapter, uh, being able to understand the terms anatomy, physiology, and disease in various related areas, be able to relate the importance of and purpose of medical terminology to anatomy, physiology, and disease, and construct and define medical terms using uh, word roots and prefixes and suffixes. Also be able to explain uh, the concept and importance of homeostasis, uh, be able to contrast the metabolic processes of anabolism and catabolism, uh, being able to relate the signs and symptoms to the disease, to the disease process, and uh, discuss disease concepts related to the body's defense mechanism. And lastly, uh, contrast uh, routes of transmission of disease and appropriate preventative measures. All right, first we'll start off with anatomy. Anatomy is the study of internal and external structures of the human body. Now, anatomy and physiology are different. They mean two separate things. Now, they are interrelated, obviously, but they mean two different things, and you'll see why when we get to uh, physiology. Now, the human body, as you can imagine, is very complex and also very amazing. So it's important that you understand how everything is put together. Now, the word anatomy is uh, from Greek, and the word literally means to cut apart. And there are various specialties that fall under anatomy such as microscopic anatomy and macroscopic anatomy. See, for microscopic anatomy, this is a very specialized field of anatomy. This is the study of structures you can only see with a microscope. That's why it's microscopic anatomy, things that are very, very tiny, such as uh, looking at uh, various features of cells or cytology, when you're studying various samples of tissues or histology. Those are, those are details that you can't see with your naked eye. You need uh, tools like a microscope to be able to study them correctly. Okay, the opposite of that would be macroscopic anatomy. This is also called gross anatomy. This is the study of structures of the body that are visible to the unaided or the naked eye. So things that you can see without any help at all, without using any other tools, such as uh, using x-rays or studying the skeletal system. You don't need a microscope for those. All right, now we'll move on to physiology. Uh, physiology is a, focuses on the function and the vital processes of various structures of the body. So anatomy is what they are made up of, you know, the structure. Physiology is how they function. So they are related, but they're not the same thing. So being able to understand how it's put together or how it should be put together, that will relate to that structure's uh, function. And physiology will also deal with uh, some vital processes that has many subspecialties. Uh, some very common uh, subspecialties of physiology, uh, human physiology, uh, animal physiology, cellular physiology, uh, neurophysiology. All of these ones listed here deal with particular functions of that organism, you know, how a human body functions, how an animal in general functions, how a cell functions, and how the brain functions. These are all very specific types of physiology. Uh, putting it all together, like we mentioned before, anatomy focuses on structures and how something is uh, put together, and physiology is studies how those, how those structures work together and make the whole body function as one unit. Now the anatomy of a of a structure or a cell can greatly influence its function, its physiology. And we'll go over an example of that here in a second. Now, human anatomy and physiology, or AMP as it's always referenced, is the foundation for all medical practice. Receiving medical treatment is an effort to return the body's structure and function back to its normal anatomy and normal physiology. Okay, here's what I mean by how uh, structure can influence uh, function. Uh, in these images, you have a close up of a blood vessel. And then within that blood vessel, you have red blood cells. That's what these are. 
And in this image, image A, these are normal red blood cells. They're that their standard biconcave shape is how they should look. And red blood cells are uh, the cells that carry oxygen to cells throughout the body. So this is how they should look. Now this image over here is someone that would have a sickle cell anemia. And it's called that because the red blood cells have a sickle shape to them here. So instead of being nice and round and you know, concave on both sides, they are sickle shaped. So when you influence that cell's structure, instead of being round, they are now uh, changing shape. You're going to influence its function because you are decreasing the size and the surface area. It can't carry as much as much oxygen as a normal red blood cell could. Also, because of their shape, they tend to get stuck and jammed into uh, blood vessels as they branch off one another. This is why people with sickle cell anemia tend to get joint pain you know, pretty often and pretty, pretty severely. The changing of this cell's structure, its shape, will greatly influence its function. It won't be able to travel like a, like a normal red blood cell should, and it won't be able to carry as much oxygen as a normal red blood cell should. All right, now we'll move on to uh, disease. So what is disease? Disease is a condition in which the body fails to function normally. Now, pathology is a study of disease characteristics and causes and its effects. And pathophysiology is a study of abnormal body function. Here are some terms that are related to disease. Uh, etiology, this is the cause of a certain disease. Epidemiology, the study of transmission and frequency of occurrence and distribution and a control of a disease. You know, being able to understand how a disease is caused or what causes a disease will influence how it would be how it would be spread, how often it may occur, and so on. Now I'll move on to different types of diseases. Uh, an idiopathic disease is a disease that there's not a known cause that can be determined. You can't pinpoint it on is it viral, is it bacterial, is it from a rodent, is it from a, a tick on a rodent. You just don't know the cause. So those are classified as idiopathic. Uh, communicable diseases. These are diseases that have the potential to spread from person to person or from insect to person. A good example of these are contagious diseases. These are readily transmitted from, from one person to another. And these are the types of diseases that are tracked by the uh, Centers for Disease Control. All right, now we'll talk about the distribution of communicable diseases, and they will vary on how widespread they are. Uh, an endemic is a disease that will occur within a specific population or a specific region. An epidemic is where disease will occur in large numbers across a specific region. Here you're getting more and more uh, advanced, more and more of a, of a spread of disease. And then you have a pandemic, which is diseases spread across an entire country or throughout the world. So endemic, serious, epidemic is bad, pandemic is really, really bad. Because when you get to this point, there's a very large number of people that are being exposed to the disease. All right, now move on to medical terminology. Now, the language of all anatomy and all physiology and all disease is based off of medical terminology. Being able to learn and understand medical terminology requires you to understand how uh, root terms work and prefixes and suffixes that are really put together to form these really big long cumbersome words that you often see when it comes to a medical setting. Now each medical term has a basic structure upon which upon which things are added to it. What you're starting with is what's called the word root. Now what is added to that word root are prefixes and suffixes. Prefixes are the parts before the word root and suffixes are parts that are added after the word root. And both of those can greatly alter the definition of that word. All right, now the word roots, these are the basic parts of all medical terms. These are often given in a combining form, usually with a, a connecting vowel to make the word sound normal. Otherwise it wouldn't flow when you say the, that word. Uh, prefixes, word parts that come before that root, and the suffixes, parts that come after that word root. And you can think of this as really a like a jigsaw puzzle. You're adding piece to piece to piece till you get a final completed term. Let's say we're talking about the term cardiology. Well, the word root, cardio, or cardi, is reference to heart. The ending, or the suffix, ology, or logi, is means the study of. So cardiology literally translates into the study of the heart. Cardiopathy. Cardio means heart, and pathy, suffix pathy, means disease of. Cardiopathy, disease of the heart. Let's see for a little bit longer word, uh, pericarditis. Peri, the prefix, always means around. Cardi, or cardio, always references the heart. And itis, always means inflammation. So when you break this long word down, you literally get inflammation around the heart. Pericarditis. 
Now the good thing about these prefixes and suffixes and root words, their definitions never, ever, ever change. So peri will always mean around. It doesn't mean if you're talking about a heart or a kidney or a lung or individual cell or the brain. Peri always means around. Cardi always means heart. Itis always means inflammation. They don't change depending on what body system you're talking about. So once you know that peri means around, you don't have to relearn that for something else later on. And here are some uh, very common uh, combining terms. It would be really difficult to list every single possible combination of every prefix, every suffix, every root word. But here are some ones that you will see very commonly. Abdomino for abdomen. Angio vessel. The cyan blue. The cyan is actually a shade of blue, so say cyanotic means a bluish color tint to them. Uh, ereth means red. Gastro, stomach, so on. Again, these definitions don't ever, ever change. You know, hist or histo is always going to be a reference to tissue. Hepato or hep hepat will always mean a reference to the liver. Uh, hydro always means water. Leuco always means white. Sometimes you'll see that spelled with a C or a K. They both mean leuco, both mean white. Uh, see, mam always means the breast. Pneumo always means the air or the lung. Uh, some common prefixes. A or an means without. So for example, uh, anaerobic. Uh, aerobic means uh, oxygen. An means without, so an anaerobic process would be without oxygen. Acro and extremities. Brady means slow. So if heart rate is uh, bradycardic, brady means slow, so that means a slow heart rate. Tachycardic would mean a fast heart rate. So you see tachy down here. So peri around, we talked about before. And here are two terms we talked about earlier. Uh, micro and macro. We talked about microscopic anatomy, macroscopic anatomy. Micro always means small, so think of a microscope. And macro always means large. So these are all very, very common prefixes prefixes that you'll see many times uh, in a medical setting. Uh, some common suffixes. Gram means an, an actual record. The electrocardiogram is a recording of the electrical activity of the heart. Uh, sight always means cell. Algia always means pain. Uh, osis, the condition of. Uh, otomy, cutting into. It's like an appendectomy, the cutting into or the removal of the appendix. Uh, pathy always means disease. Phobia, fear, fear of. If you're hydrophobic, you are afraid of water. Uh, plasty, a surgical repair. So a rhinoplasty, a surgical repair of the nose. So the fancy term for a nose job is rhinoplasty. All right, now we'll move into some common medical abbreviations. These will, are going to be used extensively in the medical profession, especially when you look at medical records or if you look at a uh, prescription from a from a doctor's office. If you see the actual. Uh, directions on the prescription order that you take to the pharmacy, you'll see usually a very long series of abbreviations. Now, these abbreviations are used to simplify very long and complicated terms for diseases or procedures or therapies, just to save time. And you'll see a lot of these come up again and again uh, in future chapters throughout this course. Here are some common ones. Uh, one, we've, one we've already talked about, A and P, anatomy and physiology. Uh, some things that you would see on I don't know, an actual prescription order or a prescription bottle, something like BID twice a day, uh, BP blood pressure, CXR a chest X-ray, uh, DX diagnosis, and so on, ICU intensive care unit, IV actually means intravenous, you know, MI heart attack or myocardial infarction. Uh, some other common ones, if you've ever had uh, a major surgery, you're usually NPO the last 24 hours before the procedure. NPO means nothing by mouth. PO orally or by mouth, uh, PRN as needed, usually for uh, pain medication. Uh, Q is always reference to every, like if you're supposed to take medicine every you know, two hours, it'd be Q2H so for every two hours. Uh, SOB doesn't mean what you think it means, it actually means shortness of breath. Uh, STAT means immediately in Latin, that's where that term comes from. TID three times a day, and of course ER or ED, depending on what hospital you're dealing with, emergency room or emergency department. All these are very, very short list of very common abbreviations that you'll find in a medical profession. All right, now I'll move on to the uh, metric system. This is the math system that is used in anatomy and physiology and basically all science. Most of the world will use uh, the metric system. There are only a few countries that don't use them. There are two major measurement systems used throughout the world. The first one, the one that's used in the United States, uh, the U.S. customary system. This one that is tends to be very cumbersome, very difficult to follow. 
because there's no real pattern to how things are measured. 12 inches to a foot, you know, 3 feet to a yard. You know, one mile is 5,280 feet. There's no real discernible pattern between how units are, are joined together. There are values that you just have to know, which just adds to the confusion. Other than the United States, most of the world will use the International System of Units, or SI. So this is what's used in every science setting because this is a much easier system to follow because it's all based on powers of 10. So because this is a system based on just a power of 10, it's much easier to follow, much easier to understand, and much easier to, to convert from one unit to another. Now the U.S. customary system, the one that is used in the United States, is based off the British Imperial System, usually called the English System. Designations for you know, length and weight and volume where you have a volume measured in ounces and pints and quarts and gallons. Distances are measured in feet and yards and miles. And weights are measured in pounds and tons and ounces. And like I mentioned before, there's no real easy to follow pattern that links all of these together, which is going to be very different from, compared to the metric system or the international system. And again, there's only a handful of, country, or handful of countries in the world that still use uh, this system. It is primarily used in the United States. Probably the most commonly used a unit of uh, the metric system that's used in the United States is liter. Now you're able to go out to a store and buy a two liter uh, container of a soft drink, for example. Liter is a metric system unit. All right, now we'll talk about uh, metabolism. This is a term that re references all the chemical operations going on throughout the body. Any chemical reaction will produce uh, waste products. So all standing reactions within your body all biological reactions are an example of metabolism. Now fever is something that is as very common among disease. This will help speed up metabolism. Now there are two types of metabolism, anabolism and catabolism. And the reason why they're different is one, you're making things bigger, and the other one, you're making things smaller. So we'll talk about anabolism first. This is where you're taking uh, smaller, simpler uh, components or reactants and building them up into something more complex. And more. So for you know, tissue repair, tissue growth, uh, reproduction. So you're taking two small things and making one larger product, more and more of a complex product. It's a common example that's used. You're taking uh, simple amino acids, joining them together to make a complex uh, protein. Now the opposite of that would be catabolism, where you start off with something large and complex and you're breaking it down into smaller components, smaller products. So an example that's used, uh, breaking down of food that you eat into chemical blocks that your cells can use for fuel. So taking the taking that pizza that you had at lunch, turning that material into usable glucose for your cells to use as energy. So that is breaking down something into smaller uh, components. So that'd be catabolism. An abnormal or an extreme example, uh, someone who's going through starvation, the body will feed upon itself, actually consuming the body's own tissue. After you get through, after you get to a certain point, the body will start to eat its own fat, eat its own muscle, as a way to get some source of energy from somewhere if they're not getting it from your diet. So you're taking something large and complex and breaking it down into smaller components that the cells can use at least at some level. So that'd be an extreme example of catabolism. All right, now I'll move on to a term that you will see often in anatomy and physiology, homeostasis. This is maintaining a nice, stable internal environment for your body. Now being able to survive is really depends on being able to maintain homeostasis. A key theme in nature that you'll see not just with humans, but in nature in general, is being as stable as possible. You know, nature wants to be as, as stable as possible, but, so you don't want any more drama than necessary. You don't want any more stress than necessary. If you are in a normal, stable uh, condition, there's less things to worry about. When you get a disease, this will get thrown off. When you get an injury, this gets thrown off. So being able to maintain homeostasis is really critical for you to be able to be kept alive. You know, keeping your blood pressure at a certain point not getting it too high or too low. You keep your breathing rate at a certain level, not too high or not too low, and so on. The regulation for homeostasis uh, refers to adjustments made in the organism uh, to maintain that stable environment. And a good example of this would be a thermostat. will control the temperature in your home. If it gets too hot, then you turn it down. If it gets too cold, you turn it up. There's a way to control how comfortable your home's temperature is by adjusting this thermostat. There are two two terms that are often go along with this regulation. The first one is the negative feedback loop. This is a continuous feedback loop to determine what action is required. If the feedback opposes that stimulus, it's considered to be a negative feedback loop. And what controls this is the hypothalamus in the brain. The hypothalamus will use the, the system, the negative feedback system, 
to control body temperature and to therefore regulate uh, homeostasis. And going back to that thermostat example in the heat, let's say you have the temperature set at say 72 degrees. If the temperature gets below that, then the heat will come on. The feedback is opposing the stimulus. It's getting colder than where it wants to be, so the heat comes on to correct that. And here's some examples instead of using a thermostat in a, in a home, talking about a person. So for the image up here on top, your normal body temperature here. Let's say your body temperature gets above normal. Your brain will signal the peripheral blood vessels to dilate. So you'll sweat. That's why you get more flushed in the face when you get hot, because blood vessels are dilating. So you're getting more blood closer to the surface of your skin. So you will sweat. Sweating will help cool you down. And that will return your body temperature back down to normal. Let's say you are starting here and you're going the other way. Let's say your body temperature gets below normal, so you're getting cold. Uh, the brain signals these peripheral blood vessels to constrict, so sweat glands will not be able to work at that point. This will shunt blood toward the more vital organs like the heart and the lungs and liver and so on. If you get too cold, you will start to shiver. This is why that you sh why you shiver when you're cold is to generate heat so you can get warmer. But when you have body heat conserved by the blood vessels you know, constricting and the addition of shivering, your body temperature will get warmer and then you go end up getting back to normal. These are all very basic, very straightforward examples of regulating homeostasis just with body temperature. All right, those are examples of negative feedback. Uh, the other system is the positive feedback loop. Now this increases the magnitude of change, but it's also known as a vicious cycle. It's not used to maintain homeostasis, but it sometimes is necessary to complete a very specific process. And this can be very dangerous if the cycle isn't broken and broken quickly. A good example of this positive feedback system is the continued contraction of the muscles of the uterus during childbirth. As the, as the cervix will start to dilate, that will signal the uterine muscles to contract. As they contract, that will push the fetus further down the birth canal. Well, when that happens, the cervix will dilate more. That causes more muscle contraction, which pushes the baby down even more. And this is the cycle that goes on and on and on for many, many hours until the baby is born. All right, now we'll move into uh, disease concepts. Uh, first one, uh, the signs. These are definitive, objective, measurable indicators of an illness. Fever, color changes, uh, size changes of a mole, and so on. Things that you are that you can objectively measure and see. Uh, some vi vital signs, like the name implies, uh, signs that are vital to life. Blood pressure, temperature, respiration rate, uh, pulse, and so on. All those are very easy to measure objectively. Here are some common uh, locations where you, you can uh, detect a pulse. They're usually done here the radial artery, down by the wrist. Also do it the brachial, the calm carotid, the femoral popliteal just behind the knee. Now, uh, symptoms, these are subjective indicators of the illness. They're only are able to be perceived by the patient. Pain, dizziness, itchiness. You can't measure pain if you aren't the patient. You can ask someone, how much pain are you in, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, but you, as the medical professional, you can't objectively measure that. You have to wait for them to tell you how much pain they're in. You have to wait for them to tell you how dizzy they are or how itchy they feel. There's nothing that you can objectively measure uh, precisely. Uh, syndrome is a specific grouping of signs and symptoms that are related to a disease. Uh, for example, Down syndrome, typical signs and symptoms, mild to moderate uh, mental retardation, uh, the sloping forehead, uh, the low set ears, the short hands tend to be very broad, and cardiovascular disease is very common, uh, the spacing of the eyes, which goes along with the sloping forehead. All those are signs and symptoms of Down syndrome. Uh, diagnosis, uh, the identification of disease, that's determined by examining the patient's signs and symptoms and history and results of all sorts of diagnostic tests. And so we'll begin by taking the, the chief complaint of the patient and the reason why that person's there to get help. You know, from learning that chief complaint, learning about the person's history and why they're there for help will determine what path you take in treatment of that person. Uh, prognosis, this is the prediction of the outcome of disease. Of course, what you want is a good prognosis, something that could be cured or dealt with you know, very quickly. I uh, see chronic and acute conditions. Chronic uh, always means something that's a gradual onset over a very long period of time. You know, some conditions take years or even decades to develop. Uh, the opposite of that, acute, this is the very rapid onset of signs and symptoms. Some conditions can develop over just a matter of hours, and how quickly they develop and take effect can determine how you treat that person. Uh, remission it's the period of time when signs and symptoms of a chronic disease will disappear. You often hear this with people who have cancer, for example. Once they go into remission, the signs 
aren't present anymore, which is good. And then relapse, the recurrence of disease. Of course, you really don't want this to be a common thing because that means the treatment will have to change. The prognosis could be different at this point. Uh, exacerbation, uh, the flaming up of signs and symptoms, of so things getting worse than they were beforehand. That usually means that the disease is more advanced and more aggressive. And of course, the probably the most serious one, terminal disease, is the one with a prognosis of death. At this point, there's nothing that can be done to correct the condition. The only way to overcome the condition is when the patient actually dies. Now we'll move into the body's defense system. Now, disease can result from uh, pathogenic uh, microorganisms like viruses, like bacteria, like mold spores that can get into your body through various ports of entry. So your first line of defense against any disease is the, uh, the skin, for example, your mechanical barrier of the skin. Things can't get you sick if they can't get inside your body in the first place. So if a virus can't get into your nose, they can't give you the flu, for example. Viruses, bacteria, fungal spores can't do any damage to you unless they get inside your body and get beyond that first line of defense of your skin. Now, the skin, for example, of course, will be more effective if it's not injured or torn or, or broken somehow. And the skin is also slightly acidic. And this kind of acidic environment will is very prohibitive to many viruses and many bacteria. Right, the immune response, this will be triggered if uh, these pathogens will get past these mechanical barriers and actually get inside your body. This is where you have microscopic body cells are going to be activated, depending on what type of infection you're talking about and how serious it is. A very large variety of cells can be activated. You have some of these body cells will actually engulf or eat harmful invaders using a phagocytosis. Some will release very strong chemical signals to break apart things that are causing you to get sick. There are some that actually will poke holes in viruses or bacteria to, so they actually dissolve away. If your body has been attacked by this certain pathogen in the past, your body will actually maintains a, a memory of all your pathogens that you've encountered. It's basically like a very large database. So this is why if you had measles as a kid, you won't get measles again as an adult because your body has already been exposed to that virus. So the response by your body's defense system is a lot stronger, and a lot more aggressive and to shut it down very, very quickly. Uh, the inflammatory response, this will occur whenever a body tissue gets injured. You'll get this from you know, physical injury, uh, intense heat, chemical irritation, uh, bee sting, or infection, for example. It's a very common signs of this kind of response. You know, redness, heat coming off of that infected area, uh, swelling, pain. And all of this is actually a good sign, even though it doesn't feel like it at the time. This is a sign that you are healing. This will isolate the injured area and increase blood flow to the area to help bring the cells that need to be there to help get you better there more quickly. So a fever is actually not always a bad thing. A low-grade fever is actually very helpful. All right, on this image, we have some various agents that are capable of causing an inflammatory response, such as poisons and acids and venoms up here, trauma or injury, uh, any kind of foreign substance, uh, physical agents, temperature extremes, radiation, uh, things that cause disease, bacteria, viruses, fungi, and allergens. Any of these can really stimulate an inflammatory response. All right, next we'll talk about various routes of disease transmission. Uh, the first one is a vector-borne transmission. These are diseases that are spread by insects or by other animals. Uh, some kind of examples, a biological vector is when you have an infected insect spreading a disease uh, from itself to a person. A very classic example is malaria. Whenever you are uh, bitten by a mosquito that is infected with this protozoan, that's how you spread malaria. That's why Mosquito nets are often used as a very effective way to help contain the spread of malaria. All right, another kind of vector is what's called a mechanical vector. This is where you have an organism present on the surface of an insect that's spread from person to person, such as a, a fly that lands on a pile of cow feces and then goes on and lands on your lunch. So, so it's not the actual fly that's making you sick, it's what the, what's being carried by that fly and landing on your food is what's making you sick. If it were the fly itself, that would be a biological vector. But because it's carrying something you know, external to itself, that would be a mechanical vector. All right, next we'll talk about uh, contact transmission. Uh, the first one, direct contact, is when a person will become sick due to the direct contact with a contagious body fluid, such as unwashed hands being tending to an open wound. This is why washing your hands is so very critical in healthcare. Something very quick and easy to do that can help reduce the spread of disease. And then you have indirect contact, it's when a person will become sick due to the contact of a contaminated object. A good example of that is you know, contracting a flu by touching a doorknob after someone who, who, is, who has been sick has already touched it. You're not in contact with that sick person directly, but what they touched, you touched, and now you're sick. 
All right, uh, some common vehicles for uh, disease transmission, uh, consumable goods such as food, whenever, whenever food gets you know, contaminated and spreads throughout a population pretty quickly, that's a common vehicle. Uh, airborne transmission, droplets of a pathogen being spread throughout the air. Uh, some standard precautions to help stopping the spread of disease. Probably the easiest one is by washing your hands, you know, whether it be with soap and water or the antibacterial soaps. Hey, a good rule of thumb to use whenever you're in a medical setting is to presume that the person you're dealing with has some kind of communicable disease. So there is some personal protective equipment that are used. You know, gloves and gowns and goggles and masks, face shields. And depending on what type of uh, patient you're dealing with will determine what kind of uh, protective equipment will be needed. All right, this chart has some, some very common precaution guidelines. As you can see, washing hands will be marked on every single one. That's always a good rule of thumb. If you aren't sure, wash your hands again just to be sure. Uh, so you wear gloves when you're contacting body fluid, you know, like blood or mucous membranes. If you are doing any of these from here down, you know, dealing with solid waste or suctioning or intubation uh, and so on, you can want to wear a gown. Uh, same thing with a mask and eyewear. So depending on what you are doing with that patient at that time will determine the type of protective equipment that you should need. You don't need a mask with eyewear if you're just taking a patient's history. Okay, it's the same thing with adjusting the IV fluid uh, or the rate of the IV fluid for a patient. You don't need to put on a mask or a gown or eyewear just to adjust to the setting on the on the dial. But you should wash your hands after you leave dealing with that patient. So some of these are very common sense, but some of these just take more experience dealing with. And again, if you aren't sure, it's always good just to wash your hands. All right, this brings us to the end of chapter one, you know, learning the language of anatomy and physiology. And we will continue with uh, this course in chapter two.